We must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories, malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Take your own advice. What happens? I tell you what happens. Wham! I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw... No delusion! Shit's getting way too complicated for me. Welcome to The Antidote. This is Greg McCann. This is Jeremy roth All right, Jeremy, finally our long-awaited return to Chapter 4 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Um, after two long months, we're finally going to get back into finishing uh, what we started um, earlier in our 11-9 cover-up series regarding um, the events uh part of the lead up to the um, events surrounding the 2016 election. And we're going to be picking up on page 189, I believe, of proof of conspiracy. Correct. Okay, here we go. And I will just um, finish up the last half of the, of the uh, paragraph that we ended on last time. All right. So page 189 of proof of conspiracy by Seth Abramson. The subtitle being how Trump's international collusion is threatening American democracy. Quote, that Psy Group knows its proposals are illegal appears to be confirmed by a subsequent Times of Israel investigation, which finds that Psy Group was reportedly told, this is a quote, yeah, quote, was reportedly told by an American law firm that its activities would be illegal if non-Americans were involved, unquote. The top brass at Psy Group, including Zamel himself, are all foreign nationals. Moreover, the Times of Israel will note that in at least one other sphere, anti-BDS boycott divest sanction Israel campaigns, Psy Group is working covertly overseas in a way that is, quote, known to the Israeli government and specifically the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, unquote. And I just... uh, Full and cool. I just want to point out again that uh, this Ministry of Strategic Affairs is crucial because they not only has someone like Avigdor Lieberman held the top position there, but they are public about the fact that they are the civil assassinations arm of the Israeli state. So if you have Kidon, which is the Mossad's assassination, uh, you know, wet works assassination unit, then they talk about civil assassination, meaning like the ability to target a political dissident and intellectual uh, nemesis and destroy them uh, in, in all, any and all ways publicly. For example, one, ex- one example that, uh, that I believe the NSO group actually worked on, maybe it was Psy group, was the targeting of a Berkeley professor, Hatem Bazian. And they ended up, uh, you know, targeting its neighbors with flyers. There's something uh, sort of GDL-ish, actually. GDL-ish about the flyering and the, the uh, sort of the targeting of the average person, you know, who's not, a, not a, an actual legitimate a military target of any sort in terms of this kind of idea of an approach of a civil assassination, I think. So I just wanted to uh, point that out, Ministry of Strategic Affairs, what, what actually Psy Group is doing. This is, this is a, this is the, uh, sort of covert arm of military intelligence, meaning the, these, it presents itself as diplomacy or something like that, or information services or, communications or PR on behalf of the Israeli government, but this is really, this is uh, information warfare. All right, bottom of page 189 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, according to an an investigative report by the Daily Beast, by the way, lots of issues with the Daily Beast background, Rick Gates and the two unnamed aides in Trump's, quote, inner circle, unquote, who solicit digital campaign ideas from Psy Group are, quote, very, very interested, unquote, in Zamel's proposals, despite the campaign's future protestations to the contrary. These protestations, which also insist that the campaign never use Psy Group services, will be challenged by several, quote, former employees, unquote, of Psy Group, who, quote, dispute the claim, unquote, 
that the, quote, firm never went forward with its plan to help the Trump campaign, unquote. And by the way, unquote, full unquote, we now know with the whole expose of uh, Team Jorge and that being a key Israeli intelligence intersect with the Cambridge Analytica uh, operation that was at the, towards the top levels of, uh, of the 11-9 operation, uh, information warfare component and Trump campaign backing. But not just, remember, like it, they started out as uh, being deployed for a, a number of candidates, but then, then it's all then goes around Trump once he's the guy. I would say once Arthur Finkelstein's network wins the primary uh, in terms of uh, pushing him into the uh, mainstream of the Republican Party. And I will imagine that there's a, a bunch of covert human intelligence and uh, influence operations that were involved in all of that also. Okay, we are very bottom of page 189 of Proof of Conspiracy by Abramson. Quote, Zamel strategically compartmentalizes his offer to collude with the Trump campaign in a way that makes it more difficult for his employees to see who their client is. Some, quote, former Psy Group employees who spoke with the Daily Beast said they only interacted with George Birnbaum, whom they were introduced to by an intermediary, and did not have contact with Gates, unquote. The possibility that a longtime aide to Benjamin Netanyahu represented himself as Psy Group's client to block Psy Group employees from identifying the Trump campaign as the end user of their work product, work product is deeply troubling. Yet other Psy Group employees report having direct contact with the Trump campaign, including several who tell the Daily Beast that they had contact with two unnamed Trump aides rather than Gates. These employees do tell the Daily Beast, however, that the members of Trump's inner circle they met, quote, were introduced to them by, quote-unquote, brokers, including Birnbaum. The employees said that they could not reveal the names of the Trump aides, citing non-disclosure agreements, unquote. It is unclear whether it was Psy Group or the Trump campaign that asked them to sign non-disclosure agreements, though either is possible given that the Trump campaign has become infamous for its aggressive use of such legal instruments during the 2016 general election. One former Psy Group employee offers this explanation for the divergent stories coming from Psy Group employees about whether the organization executed a media disinformation campaign for Trump. Quote, Joel Zamel is a very secretive guy. He holds all his cards very close to the chest. It's very possible he was running some sort of side operation that used side resources but didn't include the staff, unquote. According to the Times of Israel, one thing that is clear is that the, quote, several secretive proposals, unquote, that Zamel, in conjunction with Psy Group or otherwise, created for Gates and others' review, were created, quote, at the behest of, unquote, Gates. Moreover, the Times reports that the proposals Zamel offered to the Trump campaign in spring 2016 were the same ones he later offered to Donald Trump Jr. in August, suggesting that Gates' response to Zamel's initial approach, whatever it was, either encouraged or did not deter Zamel from taking his offer to the Trumps directly. In May 2018, a whistleblower from the Trump campaign's data firm, Cam Cambridge Analytica, tells Congress that he knows of, quote, relationships that Cambridge had had with former members of Israel's security forces, unquote, opening the possibility that whether or not Rick Gates, Donald Trump Jr., or the two unnamed aides in Trump's, quote-unquote, inner circle, partnered with Zamel or men like Zamel. They may well have referred such people and their domestic plans for domestic disinformation operations to the campaign's data firm. Full unquote. I just want to uh, direct folks to uh, John Swin's Expose the Enemy uh, channels for he, he's done a recent presentation on the Team Jorge uh, uh, revelations and then also very uh, important and interesting uh, footage of the, what, what John seems to be putting forth as the fake 
Cambridge Analytical and Analytica whistleblower Brittany Kaiser testifying to uh, to the British Parliament in terms of Cambridge Analytica, and she p- seems to be trying to protect the identity of uh, of Team Jorge and the uh, Israeli group specifically, and uh, and so the the whistleblower they're talking about in the uh, U.S. Congress is uh, actually um, what's his name, Greg, uh, the uh, the guy who wrote Mindfuck, Chris Wiley. Yes, uh, Chris Wiley's the name of the whistleblower. And um, going back to George Birnbaum, Jeremy, uh, reminded me of uh, what we found in uh, BuzzFeed on January 20th, 2019. Um, the unbelievable story of a plot against George Soros, how two Jewish American political consultants helped create the world's largest anti-Semitic conspiracy theory by Hans Grossiger in BuzzFeed, January 20th, 2019. And we've um, referred to this article on air on the program and uh, the two uh, two people in question are, are Arthur Finkelstein and George Birnbaum. So there's uh, bringing Birnbaum back into the, um, the thing. And of course, that's not to say there's nothing to the Soros quote unquote conspiracies, just that this is the weaponization of them that we've seen just so prioritized over the course of uh, recent history, where it's just everything just goes back to the desk of George Soros. And George Soros is seen as the self-hating Jewish Nazi collaborator who takes delight in hurting Israel and hurting law-abiding Western citizens and all that. So um, just linking uh, Birnbaum and Finkelstein back to the uh, George Soros narratives as we know them. Yes, and again, we should point out that Definitely, you know, the Soros, uh, you know, sor- uh, sources, the Soros-backed sources, in especially in the West, are, are almost always are operating on some kind of limiting certain kinds of hangouts. Very obviously, uh, so it's not a matter, of, like you pointed out, of of uh, dismissing all of uh, George Soros' analysis. But we should point out that in a, I would say in a similar kind of fashion, the narrative warfare dynamics of turning George Soros into the ultimate globalist boogeyman that, you know, can be readily uh, do- anti-Semitically dog whistled by, especially by the alt-right that was so intensely targeted to support someone like Trump uh, as somehow some kind of uh, crypto anti-Zionist or crypto anti-Jewish power kind of candidate, that the reality of all of this is very similar to the way that the 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 oligarchs that Putin targeted uh, in Russia, that even such people who pride themselves on being anti-Kuka, you know, Kukification like Ryan Dawson, continue to repeat the a largely a very similarly fraudulent kind of narrative warfare and weaponization of actual you know historical analysis around someone like George Soros and that really what happened in Russia in terms of Putin and the oligarchs is Putin appeared to target oligarchs that were not he could not he was he didn't believe that he and his Siloviki um newly formed with a legacy of KGB uh, you know, and into FSB deep state insiders could actually uh, manage and discipline like he was able uh, other ones. And that whole infamous video of of Putin proving that he's disciplining the oligarchs by demanding its pen back from Oleg Deripaska. And when in reality, it, the, the oligarchs it, it, who were, uh, who basically were booted Right. And remember, all of this is under the guise of that Putin's kicking out the Rothschilds. Now, people might also want to go to another recent John Swin Expose the Enemy uh, video where he does a, uh, a counter analysis in relationship to actually some of the history behind the Nord Stream, uh, pipe, uh, Nord Stream pipelines and specifically about uh, there's aspects of showing that the Rothschilds are still operating in Russia and uh, in, in very specific energy networks and investments and all that. But the actual oligarchs who were actually kicked out of, uh, of Russia or targeted, some of them ended up dead, others, uh, you know, uh, just, just kicked out. A lot of them tended to be the, the billionaires who seemed to be publicly against the Chechen war. Now, George Soros, you can, I don't think you can name a, uh, a more prominent 
Jewish billionaire uh, in the world who was against the Iraq war or who has called for a certain limited criticism of the Israeli apartheid state uh, and, and all of that. And so that is very, very uh, interesting, the nature of the targeting. And now that it's so obvious that a lot of this tracks right back to the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs and Benjamin Netanyahu's network and Benjamin Netanyahu's son, Yair Netanyahu, memifying and uh, exploding this big tweet that was basically the the arch uh, meme of the George Soros conspiracy. And then he has Ehud Barak underneath it. And it's all attend, you know, the, the sort of what the normal anti-anti-Semitic networks would say, and they, a lot of them did point this out, too, that this is the uh, arch of classical anti-Semitism with the, the tentacles and all of this with the lone Jewish, you know, controller at the top. And this is George Soros and all of that. So this is, shows itself to be totally political narrative warfare. A lot of it tracking right back to these Finkelstein, Finkelstein and uh, especially Netanyahu, and I would say Ministry of Strategic Affairs puts it also into uh, Avigdor Lieberman uh, territory. So that that re- I think we really can now uh, address that as such. Um, good point. And uh, when Yair Netanyahu came over to the United States, who was he hanging out and taking photographs with? It was Tucker Carlson, of course. So, uh, you know, and I mean, that right there, I think, is a pretty, um, pretty telling sign with uh, Tucker being the guy to talk about great replacement and all this and dog whistle in the same way that uh, Yair Netanyahu did. I'm sure they're both loved by the Daily Stormer and Andrew Meyer. Rothschild Anglin and his and his types of people, but uh, one more interesting thing on this whole Soros element is um, there's a couple things here to this is that uh, number one um, the idea of the much like with Soros you have to the the anti-Putin oligarchs and the anti-Putin Russian elites um, that were kicked out and stuff it goes beyond just being against um, certain wars in the case of Soros it's funding media activism circles that were against the Iraq war that are against elements of um, the apartheid state of Israel among to some extent or another differing extents but then also it moves beyond that to they're literally destroying our societies like you know Soros is destroying our society in every way under the sun if you listen to the you know right wing uh, media machines and I think the same is true within Russia and so then not only then do you move from uh, being, um, which both these things are not really talked about all that much, like in terms of Soros' anti-war funding. I think it was a somewhat of a big deal in the Bush days, but since then, like it doesn't really get talked about nearly as often as like the um, the obviously the. And even then, Soros is a warmonger because Syria and flooding Europe with refugees and all that. So I mean, now where like it's the the left and the Democrats are the warmongers and Soros is now, I guess, part of that. But the anti-war history of like Iraq funding and um, events related to Israel are not covered as much as how, oh, Soros is destroying our society every way under the sun. And then I think the same way is true. So then things like, um, ultimately, I think that plays this vilifying to this level, ultimately does play a role to where somebody like Putin can then move the goalposts, so to speak, and not only say we're fighting to bring Ukraine back into Russia where it belongs and stopping this Western aggression against us, but also we're fighting for civilization and we're fighting to keep our respective societies from being undermined by these cultural degenerates and uh, and all this that not only want to take us to war, but want to destroy our society. So I think there's a part of this that allows um, that to be perpetuated the way it is with like Putin increasingly playing into his lang- into this language with uh, his recent speeches, uh, first in 2022, and now the one he just made uh, this past week where invoking like the, the destroyers of society and the cultural degeneracy and all this. So that plays into this. And then the other thing is, I think with the, this is just a bit of an aside, but the remnants of the Soros Foundation, quote unquote, left uh, media activism circles, a lot of that, I think, has split off to where now you have some of the remnants of that are still in the American camp as far as like being uh, American-based uh, uh, 
opposing like Russia and Syria and maybe more or less taking like an American side or the more traditional like U.S. anti-war, quote unquote, anti-imperial circles. And then elements of like the Soros machine or in the past Soros machine have flipped to this more Russian friendly side of things. And in some cases, some of those people have even come out against like the Soros machine and are spouting the same talking points from a leftist step uh, vantage point as these uh, long term uh, right wing uh, narratives against Soros are going. So there's some interesting dynamics that play out with like this um, with this Soros question, both in terms of how it's used to further perpetuate narratives that go beyond just fighting a war in Ukraine to protect Russian interests and stop Western aggression, but then also in terms of like what has happened to the Soros Foundation funded um, media activism circles over the last uh, number of years since this full on Russian push into um, into our societies and into the alternative media in particular. Yes, very important point that the that the uh, the escalation to the pinnacle of the culture war, the global culture war, right, are articulated by the Putin sphere and then echoed by all of the sort of all quote unquote alt it's sort of semi alt right media in the in the United States, such as like the E. Michael Jones and the Kevin Barrett's and and that that kind of circle of the World War Three to be perpetrated by Globo, Globo Homo Mafia or something like that. And you're right, like Putin has directly like now Putin obviously he acts as a statesman, so he tones down the rhetoric in and paints it in a way that that can be uh, seen as not totally propagandistic uh, in the, in those kinds of Andrew Meyer, Am- Amshaw, Anglin, uh, Rothschild terms. But uh, he definitely the he, he's playing right into it. And then when you throw in the whole rise of this entire internationalist, very sort of fascist right set that Putin is in, in alliance with, apparently. And you throw in people like Trump and Orban and, and and the Finkelstein relationship with bringing those both into power. It's it's a it's a textbook. It's a playbook. It's a you know it's a an emphasis on the shadowy Western, some dog whistling Jewish uh, billionaire like uh, George Soros uh, coming and in invading and trying to open up our societies and the and the dangerous uh, migrants from the Syrian war. And uh, and uh, and we need to, uh, you know, take take a stand for uh, small T traditionalism, even though it's really very likely a weaponized covert form of capital T traditionalism, traditionalism pushed by these hardcore Russian intelligence, Dugan, uh, Malafiev type networks. And then their intersection in many often in Iran at the uh, New Horizons conference with these exact people uh, in the West, such as the E. Michael Jones and the Kevin Barrett's, and then you throw in the the uh, security and intelligence and military uh, dissident types that, that are all a part of that, such as Phil Giraldi or Scott Scott Bennett. And uh, and you begin to really see a, a, a straight-up narrative warfare uh, attempt to really pitch the culture war and heighten it and use it not only to install politicians, but then to further the actual domestic, uh, and this is, you know, around the world, domestic political divide and conquer uh, chaos politics that that uh, continue to be deliver the payload, I think, that that we see, especially in the United States in the wake of the 11-9 operation uh, that continues. And COVID-19 has been a godsend in this regard as well, in a major, big-time way. True. All right, back to the text 191 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, according to a startling October 2018 report by the Daily Beast, it wasn't just Gates, Trump Jr., and two members of Trump's circle who heard Zamel's pitch. While it will remain unclear if the candidate himself ever met with Zamel face-to-face pre-election, according to the Daily Beast, Trump, quote, heard Zamel's plan, unquote. Contradicting the campaign's claim that Zamel never worked with it pre-election, the Daily Beast will report that, indeed, quote, Trump's team drew in Zamel during the campaign, unquote. New section. 
quote, as a company run by ex-Israeli military officers is approaching members of the Trump campaign in the United States, the campaign's nominal is Israel expert Papadopoulos is making his two unusual campaign-approved trips to Greece. During the first, in early May, he meets with a Greek journalist from Katamerini and acts like, quote, a second-rate actor in a political thr thriller, unquote, according to the journalist Alexis Papachelas, who says Papadopoulos, quote, lowered his voice so as not to be overheard. It actually says overhead, but I think it's overheard. And dropped hints of major contacts, mainly in Israel, unquote. And just quickly, uh, an aside here, you know, the, the background of Papadop Papadopoulos is a crucial character, not because he's some kind of high-functioning, uh, you know, veteran of these networks. He's actually super young. He's super young for his position. He's seemingly super incompetent to some extent for his position, but he comes up through the, the ranks of, I believe he w was working for the Manhattan Institute, and then he's uh, put into these networks uh, uh, to be a quote-unquote energy expert in relationship to the Middle East and Israel uh, specifically. And I'll just point out again that we mentioned that we'd uh, found the Twitter thread, uh, the Twitter uh, account of uh, Scott Ritter's uh, KGB-trained uh, tr uh, translation wife, and, uh, and it has a very similar kind of vibe, I'll say, to what I remember of the Twitter uh, threads of uh, of George Papadopoulos' wife, Magienta, Magienta or something like that, who's said to be uh, Italian, but people don't really believe it. The accent's a little wrong, and the background's a little wrong, and and uh, and all of that. So the like, once again, we come back to questions of honeypots and uh, and long term cultivation of these uh, quote-unquote dissident men or campaign operatives or rising stars in political parties and, uh, and who they are literally in bed with. Um, it was the Hudson Institute that uh, Papadopoulos was affiliated with, oh, the one you. that uh, Michael Tracy was uh, dumbfounded that uh, Papadopoulos had a connection to because those are neocons. That's a neocon. <laughs> That's what he said, right? That's a neocon. <laughs> I believe so. Yes, yes. He was uh, he was dumbfounded and shocked. <laughs> and and again, like you know, someone like the uh, the real Michael Tracy, uh, who maybe might be uh, Robbie Robbie Martin, uh, he figured this out much uh, longer. And he also looked into the that's a neocon background of uh, someone like uh, Crystal Ball's uh, partner. On the, the Sagar and Jetty, and I think that he's from—is he from Hudson or Manhattan? I can't remember. I believe Sagar and Jetty is from a Hudson Institute as well. Okay, maybe that's who I was th uh, uh, th thinking of. And uh, and you and this again, this is this is where Robbie, you know, is five years behind the ball in terms of the analysis of what that actually means. This is strong Israeli neocon connection to the heart of the Trump campaign. And this whole thing is being coordinated in relationship to other Middle Eastern leaders be, be, besides Netanyahu and then on directly into what was going on in terms of Kremlin operations. And, uh, and this would help explain the 11-9 operation. And yet we, all these 9-11, you know, investigators are totally either ignorant, I would say some of them are willfully ignorant and some are just totally blind uh, to what's been going on. And then others are just, others especially in the further alt media are just uh, lying about it. They're acting as uh, sort of information control operatives of this much larger uh, narrative warfare framework, I think. All right. We are in the middle of page 191 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, Pap Papachelas concludes that Papadopoulos has been, quote unquote, assigned a job, unquote, by the Trump campaign, but might be, quote, too green or too flippant, unquote, to carry it out successfully. According to the Washington Post, which quotes Adonis Gior Georgiadis, 
a leading Greek politician, when Papadopoulos came to Greece in May 2016, he was, quote, totally unknown. But then Greek Defense Minister Panos Kamenos took him by the hand and promoted him everywhere, unquote. The Post describes Kamenos as, quote, a pro-Russian Greek nationalist who brags often of his insider Moscow connections and push for an end to sanctions imposed on Russia by the United States and others, unquote. Georgiadis calls Kamenos, quote, one of the strongest Putin supporters in Greece, unquote. Curiously, Kamenos was in D.C. attending the annual American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, conference on the day Trump convened his National Security Advisory Committee for the first time at the Trump International Hotel, the event at which Papadopoulos revealed to Trump that he had been tasked by the Kremlin to act as an, quote, intermediary, unquote, in setting up a secret Trump-Putin summit. Unquote, just, you know, just, again, note, note the Kremlin, the Kremlin-Israeli ties here, right? And, and this very, you know, I, I think a deeper dive into the background um, of, uh, of Komenos would be, would probably warrant uh, a lot of, uh, uh, important analysis in terms of the network that he's probably been a part of for a long time. Very likely, I would say, you know, a long-term agent of of Russian intelligence. I mean, that <laughs> would make sense. So, and there, there he is, an APAC in D.C. And uh, so, people need to reconsider what's going on here. All right, top of page one ninety two. A Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, It is unclear if Papadopoulos met Kamenos in Washington in late March 2016, though Kamenos' extraordinary commitment to introducing Papadopoulos to powerful figures in Athens five weeks later suggests it is possible. By the time Papadopoulos returns to Greece in late May 2016, a trip that occurs while Vladimir Putin is also in Athens, he is, according to the Post, quote, quietly holding meetings across town and confiding in hushed tones that he is there in Athens on a sensitive mission on behalf of his boss, Donald Trump, unquote. The nature of the mission, at least in part, is, according to Papacella's interview with Papadopoulos at the time, to, quote, secretly plan a pre-election trip by Trump to Greece and Israel, which he, Papadopoulos, saw taking place that July, unquote. Whether the campaign's decision to have Papadopoulos travel to Greece while Putin is there is indeed connected to a, quote, secret plan, unquote, to have Trump visit the Greece and Israel in July is unclear. However, Papadopoulos had just weeks earlier told Trump that the Kremlin wanted him to set up a Trump-Putin summit, preferably in a neutral city, and being in Athens while Putin's entourage was there would afford him an excellent opportunity to try to do so. The day before Putin's scheduled meeting in Athens with the Greek foreign minister, Nikos Kotsias, Papadopoulos meets with Kotsias and tells him he knows the Kremlin possesses quote-unquote thousands of Hillary Clinton's emails. He does so immediately after and in response to Kotsias saying to Papadopoulos that quote, where you are sitting right now tomorrow, Putin will be sitting there, unquote. In an interview he will give to CNN in September 2018, Papadopoulos will say that at the time it was, quote, his impression that the Russians were trying to hire him to be a source for them, unquote. As to whether by May 2016 Papadopoulos had already told the Trump campaign about the Kremlin's possession of the Clinton emails, Papadopoulos will cryptically tell CNN, quote, at this time I don't remember, unquote. When CNN's Jack, uh, Jake Tapper reminds him of Trump aide John, John, Mashburn's, John Mashburn's congressional testimony that he received an email from Papadopoulos informing the campaign of the Kremlin's crimes, Papadopoulos comments, quote, I don't think that proof has been provided, unquote. Pressed by Tapper as to whether he might have told anyone on the Trump campaign about the Clinton emails in the same way he had told the Greek foreign minister in May 2016, Despite having just met him and not being in his employ, Papadopoulos will finally answer, quote, I might have, unquote, 
adding that he, quote, can't guarantee, unquote, he didn't. Papadopoulos also will concede to Tapper that it's, quote, possible, unquote, he told the Australian ambassador during a meeting in London just a few weeks before he traveled to Greece that, quote, the Russians might use material that they have on Hillary Clinton, unquote. It is just a week after Papadopoulos' meeting with Kotsias that Trump's son, Don Jr., receives, via Rob Goldstone, a message from the son of one of Trump's Russian business partners stating that the Kremlin has, quote, documents and information that would incriminate Hillary, unquote. End of section. Quote, in mid-June 2016, WikiLeaks announces that it has, quote, emails relating to Hillary Clinton, which are pending publication, unquote. And the Democratic National Committee announces that it has just discovered it was hacked in April by the Russian government a hack later determined to have been conducted by Russia's military intelligence unit, the GRU. The same week as the DNC announcement, the GRU begins disseminating the materials it stole. As for the emails the GRU stole from the Clinton campaign's employees and volunteers in March, many of these will indeed ultimately be released by WikiLeaks in October 2016. Unquote. Now, I know there's, you know, there's tons of quote-unquote controversy about the DNC hacks and Russian intelligence or whether it's, you know, domestic players or it's the Israelis being framed. Uh, I mean, the Israelis framing the Russians or if it's Seth Rich and all of that. Um, but let's just point out that the role that, uh, you know, the back, we've, we've, we, early on we started talking about the real background of WikiLeaks and what politically they, they were actually uh, accomplishing to some extent, right? We pointed out the early uh, touting of WikiLeaks. Of, but first of all, like the Alan Dershowitz was early legal uh, co counsel to, to uh, WikiLeaks, I believe. Um, and, uh, and then ev eventually, you know, Julian Assange ends up with his own show on RT, I think, or is, is featured often, but I think he has his own show for a while there. You know, and so whether or not people know it when they're on RT, they are assets of Russian state intelligence. You know, just as anyone would not deny that anyone who's on Voice of America, uh, you know, is the is an asset, is working as an asset of uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence communications networks, right? And uh, so I just wanted to to point out the background here. And now a lot has been made of the veterans for. Uh, veteran intelligence professionals for sanity's response to the question of who did the DNC hack, uh, and uh, and people rely a lot on Bill Binney's uh, apparent initial assessment of it. Jimmy Dore made tons of hay over it, but Binney even ultimately, I don't, I think he retracted his, what he had originally, you know, the original take by that was supposedly signed off on by the VIPs around that. So people need to actually maybe dig a little bit deeper there. And I don't know the forensics of that background there, but uh, I, I, I get a sense that this is a, 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 a severe place of weakness around the 11-9 disinformation networks uh, narrative and that they are quite hoping to bury the actual forensics of the DNC hack in controversy and red herrings and claims of individuals that were actually never really as solid as they said. So I just want to uh, bring that up. I'm not claiming that I know for sure that this is, this is the truth. I haven't done the forensics investigation, but the whole network surrounding this actually is suggestive of exactly this is what happened. Russia, if you're listening, release the emails. <laughs> um, also, though, even to this day, um, and maybe it makes sense uh, in terms of like um, for for reasons, uh, the primary defenders of Assange, like it's entirely almost like a Russian, um, Russian in nature. And I mean, even outlets like Democracy Now that have been defensive of Assange get criticism for not being defensive enough of Assange from like these like openly, I'd say, like uh, Russian friendly types of people such as uh, Aaron Matei and Max Blumenthal. And then also it's interesting, even um, you could, we talk about horseshoes all the time here on the antidote that it were set up like in the Trump era and you have like the whole Russia 
on one end, like the more Russian-friendly defenders of Assange, and then you have like the ostensible hawks against Russia, such as a uh, CIA director and Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo, who uh, were said, you know, they were the Assange hawks, the Russia hawks within the administration. But when push comes to shove, like they went along, obviously, with the 11-9 and everything that came along with it. So you get the sense that even there was like, say, Pompeo versus Assange, like it just seems to be at some level or another more uh, horseshoe activity going on with the, at a bigger level, like they're all advancing the same narrative just under like it's the idea of the anti the, the war hawk in the administration who wants to punish the leaker that's seen as helping russia versus while he's a primary part of the geopolitical agenda that brought trump in that aids all of these uh, multinational russian centric efforts to install him and get what they wanted out of the administration so i get more horseshoe uh, vibes from that Horseshoe Hawks, yeah. The, the Pompeo's claims to the, that uh, Assange, I think recently he's even said Snowden too, they should be killed, right? That, that sounds very much like Lindsey Graham, she, key Senate uh, collaborator and uh, defender of the 11-9 operation in relationship to Trump, even after he publicly said that the GOP should be, would and probably should be destroyed if they got in bed with Trump, then got in bed with Trump. And uh, and, you know, Lindsey Graham is is probably the most publicly hawkish in relationship to Putin after the invasion uh, of Ukraine. I believe he says, you know, basically, Putin, we should go in and kill Putin, kill their leaders. He sounds like the Ann Coulter of the Senate, you know, kill kill their leaders and uh, convert them to U.S. neoconservative neolibertarianism or something like that, you know, or, so, I, you know, and so I, I agree with you, Greg, that the these uber quote unquote hawks seem to be playing some kind of horseshoe scenario, similarly to the way that we analyze the anti, the quote unquote anti-Soviet hawks that seem to very, very often via the Israeli connection actually serve mm -hmm. the uh, contingents on quote unquote both sides of the U.S.-Russia tension operation uh, to uh, escalate very uh, specific kinds of programs. So that would be going back to the Frank Gaffney types, the Michael Ledeen types, right? Mm -hmm. And that whole uh, network that is highly suspicious in relationship to both the architecture of the cold, the uh, the culture war and the war on terror. And, uh, and so I, I agree with you on that. And on that note, um, Lindsey Graham just uh, co-authored an op-ed with Boris Johnson for the Wall Street Journal about the importance of continuing to give Ukraine as much as it can to make sure Russia loses. And so you've got Lindsey Graham, the American hawk, who totally fell in line with Trump after being threatened, I mean, by Trump basically putting his number out in public and all of the language and talking that went on between them. And then um, Boris Johnson, the played a role in Brexit, um, helped bring Brexit about, has his own connections to um, – multinational Russian sphere um, interests and operatives that uh, belie, I think, the hawkish tone he's currently taking on on Russia, Ukraine. So there's something going on outside of just like haw hawks on the Russia-Ukraine war here with both of them. So I just think it's interesting that you've got Boris Johnson and Lindsey Graham co-publishing an op-ed that all of like the Russian-centric people can point to as saying, hey, look, it's the American and British neocons urging the destruction of Russia, and there's more going on here than that with both of them, I think. And and even the the if you look at the sort of the deeper political history of the WikiLeaks content itself that's been released, the earliest uh, obvious uh, analysis was that WikiLeaks was serving Israeli state interests by in some sort in terms of what it what it was leaking, what it was not. Uh, of course, the infamous early public comment by Assange, uh, anti 9/11 truth. We have the we he said we have the evidence for real conspiracies. I don't think we should get fixated basically almost on these made up kind of uh, conspiracies. Now, who does that protect? You know, you know, I would say obviously Larry Silverstein's a weekly caller, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, would be one person it would be serving, but in a more structural geopolitical way. It was obvious that that what WikiLeaks was was dumping was actually serving what ultimately became the Abraham Accords and the specific geopolitical uh, uh, attempt to use the uh, Trump years to solidify what had been a much more covert 
Arab-Israeli uh, collaboration to, uh, you know, face off in some way against against Iran. And uh, and so that was obvious. And then what became more obvious over the years was certain facilitation of Russian interests around yeah. aspects of oil and global warming and also seemingly protecting uh, those secrets. And it, it was, uh, you know, yes. so that, I think that this is another example of this very interesting Russian-Israeli uh, access and relationship to, quote-unquote, dissident propaganda, uh, you know, th that that comes out of the West. Yeah. And the Abraham Accords, of course, um, is empowering the interests that are not going to be friendly to the American um, foreign policy establishment. And uh, and it is another means of ultimately um, undermining and maybe uh, lessening American uh, global power and influence in that region of the world. And then also, even you mentioned the being constantly annoyed by the fake conspiracies. I believe that's what Assange said, something along those lines of the constant annoying that he has, annoyance that he has by those. And uh, his big claim to fame, it was the collateral damage video, correct? Yes. And that was done in a way that like, yeah, as good as, yeah, as important as it is to expose um, crimes being committed in war, that was, a, that had a major role in undermining the American global credibility in this way that we ultimately see through the Trump operation through 11-9 through foreign influence operations as being in this counterproductive way that instead of like um, exposing crimes and uh, illegal activities in a way that could benefit societies, what it did was it was part of parcel of this discrediting America and the world to um, in the way that it's been used by that we've seen used so often and so consistently over the past number of years. And I think that video and the rise of WikiLeaks in that regard was a pretty um, essential part of that. And I would point out, too, that uh, similarly to the very uh, interesting analysis that you and uh, Sebs from uh, Doom's Dungeon did recently in relationship to the question of the, you know, the actual state sponsored uh, military versus the potential of contractors in a deep political way, the, the, um, you know, the uh, transparency. And remember that there's a, I have a whole background of uh, analyzing the difference between transparency and accountability and that transparency without accountability actually becomes a way of propagandizing people to hopelessness and or to normalizing uh, what's being made transparent while also tricking them into thinking that everything has been made uh, transparent. But the, the, the uh, point that you all make is that, you know, this question of, at the very least, there are certain kinds of international law, domestic uh, military uniform code of justice kinds of things that uh, that the, the that state based militaries can be held to uh, account for, and while meanwhile it was obvious that the a big part of really the, the Bannon uh, operation uh, underlying the Trump uh, administration had to do with quote unquote privatization or the attack on the 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 administrative state right uh, undermining bureaucracy. Uh, in total, where they then get in bed with the libertarian right in terms of basically just targeting uh, the public sector and the state in general as the the locus of all evil. The sort of the state becomes the George Soros in in that uh, in that structural uh, analysis. And but what it really does is it it uh, rises up the uh, landscape for which to switch out military for contractors. Now, this is now fully on display uh, in Ukraine in relationship to the Wagner Group, and there are tensions there. It's obvious that the Wagner Group was being used for the extra vicious uh, operations, the, uh, the frontline extra vicious operations, uh, and so that there, there would not be a focus on the actual enlisted Russian military uh, in, in the time, and now there's some tension, obviously. There is Prigozhin, uh, Putin's just a hot dog contractor, according to Max Blumenthal. Does anyone still believe Max Blumenthal after he spent years calling Prigozhin a hot dog vendor? Now that he's totally public in relationship to managing a Wagner and the aggressive warfare and all of that. Well, you don't need to worry about Wagner because America commits war crimes, so don't worry about them. 
And we saw the, it was obvious that one of the problems that the Flynn and Bannon network had with uh, uh, General McMaster, you know, coming in after Flynn uh, and apparently trying to root out actually some of the Flynn network, including someone like uh, Ezra Cohen Watnick. And more and more, you know, we continue to see that being the actual, you know, very likely network origin of the entire Q uh, Anon phenomenon. Uh, and the way that it was intensely weaponized, uh, that, that that network didn't like McMaster, it looks like, because McMaster didn't want to accede to their plan to basically put in Eric Prince's, uh, you know, legacy Blackwater networks uh, in, in to manage the, the U.S. military withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, and so we saw that over and over again. The, the under the guise of the attack on the deep state was really the attack on the quote unquote administrative state, which was really the attack on the state, which was really the attack on the public, which was really the attack on uh, domestic and international law. I would say at some level, and then ultimately the, uh, a bait and switch operation to put in all these uh, criminal contractor networks. Right, uh, McMaster wasn't Russia free reign to do as it pleases at the time in Syria. He was not overly enthusiastic about moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. He, remember, uh, Roger Stone, according to Safra, or was Safra said to... Katz. Yeah, yeah. Safra Katz. Yeah, Roger Stone had reported that um, that McMaster had called Trump a, quote, fucking idiot to um, Safra Katz of uh, Oracle at the time. And he was trying against these, um, he was trying to, it looks like for whatever the motives are there. And once again, as John Brisson would always say, H.R. McMaster is not our guy, no way, shape or form. But he was trying to root out these, uh, the remnants of the Flynn network, the person whose place he took as national security advisor as Flynn was the, bridge too far even for the people who ultimately went along with and covered up so much of the Trump operation. He was the guy who was removed right away because of, I think, the threat that it posed, actual threat posed to directly in the role of national security advisor. But it was a, um, yeah, these these varying 11-9 interests all had like a vested stake, the Russian factor, the Israeli factor, and the, um, the American, uh, our own Right wing, vast right wing conspiracy, deep state elements had their own vested interest in um, McMaster being out of there. And so then the of course, like that's one of the problems, which is looking at, like anybody that just comes from, quote unquote, the establishment from the elite systems. And of course, McMaster would probably qualify as what we call a paleo neocon, but he's not in the vein of like these people that took over the government and were making all of these moves. And then, of course, what you mentioned, the other strike was uh, being against the privatized mercenary takeover of Afghanistan. So there were a lot of things working against him. And he was out within a year, just about, and replaced by John Bolton. So there you go. There you go. All right. We're back to the bottom of page 193 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, I'll reread this. Quote, as for the emails the GRU stole from the Clinton campaign's employees and volunteers in March, Many of these will indeed ultimately be released by WikiLeaks in October 2016. In mid-June, however, the Trump campaign erroneously believes that these materials will be coming out in late June or early July, having heard from Roger Stone that WikiLeaks will shortly be releasing materials damaging to Clinton. WikiLeaks ultimately publishes stolen DNC emails in July, leading to Trump being, quote, generally frustrated that the Clinton emails had not been found, unquote, or, if found, not yet released. Meanwhile, Manafort, quote, expresses excitement, unquote, about WikiLeaks' July release and asks to be, quote, kept apprised, unquote, of any new information about future releases. Unquote. Just a brief aside here, I, I don't believe any of these uh, people who have been interviewing Paul Manafort in his post-book a podcast, uh, you know, uh, tour have even asked him about this, this, uh, this if info, let alone all of the actual deep, uh, uh, information around the background of him in Ukraine or 2004 of the link potentially between the, the networks, uh, behind, uh, us 2004 and Ukraine 2004. Um, but then that actually now includes like, you know, the, some of the heart of what's sort of, touted to be the alt-left 
uh, media, someone like Kim Iverson, she recently interviewed uh, uh, Paul Manafort too. Very softball interview. And of course, sort of propping up a bunch of Paul Manafort, I would say basically deception uh, in terms of his actual background and the uh, the undermining of the actual corrupt background that he has, especially in relationship to, uh, uh, you know, a key figure like Deripaska. Deripaska should have been deeply and immediately delved into by all of these people, especially post McGonagall uh, charging. Well, it's nice to know Kim Iverson, anti-war Kim Iverson, who spoke about what the America she loves would be like at the uh, Rage Against the War Machine rally. Um, it's totally fine with one of the architects of the dictator's lobby, along with uh, Roger Stone and uh, Charlie Black. So that's good to know. I mean, that in and of itself, like, should be. But then on top of all of that, like, this is what the anti-war movement in a um, domestic capacity has devolved into, is giving propaganda interviews to the likes of Paul Manafort. Thank you for nothing. Yeah, thanks for nothing. Like, this, if if there's any lobbyist syndicate at some level that was not only in bed with the you know, those behind the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the setting up of Ukraine over a long period of time for really for destabilization and political uh, influence and eventual overflow is what it looks, uh, overthrow it looks like, uh, but also of the American oligarchy and the American uh, deep state uh, involvement in looting and pillaging in Africa and all around, as you point out, it's these dictator lobbyists, these dictator lobbyists, Paul Manafort, He's not just a quote unquote political genius, as I, he seems to be framed, or some kind of political savant. He's the arch, uh, you know, uh, deployer of the dictator's lobby that is looted and, and helped loot and pillage uh, Africa, right? So this is a total corruption to sort of re bring this guy back in as some kind of American dissident. Now, Paul Manafort is now being framed by the same crew that sort of, uh, you know, highlights Assange as the the arch case of uh, anti-journalistic, uh, you know, um, evil in the world are now lifting up Paul Manafort as some kind of political dissident targeted by the the evil, evil archy American deep state because he's speaking too much truth. Yeah, it's pretty pathetic, along with uh, Andrew Breitbart's former writing and man, uh, B. Stranahan, who says that uh, Paul Manafort's a political prisoner. But, uh, and then um, there's some interesting Cold War, uh, late Cold War era whole political horseshoe dynamics, I think, at play with the stuff that uh, Stone and uh, Manafort were, um, and Charlie Black were working uh, to benefit and advance the interests of with their dictators' lobby back in the 80s. Now be worth like more. I mean, we know some of it, but that's also worth more of a closer look, I think. And also, Manafort is either a savant, genius political operative, or a guy, or a guy who's way over his head who likes to wear flashy ostrich suits. If you're Aaron Mate, so it can go either way, I guess. That's a good point. The controversialization uh, is another avenue to go, which is very similar to the way that the deep crimes of the Bush administration uh, and even the Obama administration uh, coming from the sort of like fake opponents on the right, but definitely of the Trump years uh, it was done was to make everything as, as you, as Sarah Kenzier from Gaslit Nation always points out that this is actually at the core of Trump uh, strategic communication is to turn corruption into controversy, into sort of social controversy uh, and this is exactly the line that Aaron Mate, the Aaron Mate types deploy when they are, uh, you know, running cover for these 11-9 coup operators. It's a good point, Greg. All right, we are at the bottom of page 193, A Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, the Mueller report will broadly conclude that, quote, the Trump campaign showed interest in WikiLeaks releases of hacked materials throughout the summer and fall of 2016, unquote. According to the report, by late summer, the campaign, quote, was planning a press strategy, a communications a campaign, and messaging based on the possible release of Clinton emails by WikiLeaks, unquote. With Trump somehow having a separate channel of information about WikiLeaks besides Manafort, whose conduit was Gates, as evidenced by Trump telling Gates upon the completion of a phone call from an unknown party that, quote, more releases of damaging information would be coming, unquote, from WikiLeaks. 
an organization that Trump's first CIA director and eventual secretary of state, as you point out, Greg, Mike Pompeo, subsequently labels after Trump is elected a, quote, hostile non-state intelligence service often abetted by state actors like Russia, unquote. End of section. Quote, in late June 2016, Michael Flynn ends his consulting work with ACU strategic partners, work intended to bring together the governments of the United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel, and, be and begins consulting for an affiliated group, IP3 Iron Bridge, which is run by a former ACU advisor. By August 2016, IP3 Iron Bridge, in conjunction with Flynn, has produced a PowerPoint presentation for MBS's father called, quote, a presentation to His Majesty King Salman bin Abdul Aziz, unquote. That the IP3 Iron Bridge presentation, which, as with ACU, ACU's work, focuses on multinational deals to build nuclear power plants in the Middle East, is intended to propose a new alliance between Saudi Arabia and the United States, is confirmed by the presence in the PowerPoint slides of official Saudi and American seals next to each other. As Flynn is by now widely known to be a top Trump advisor, the implication in the presentation cannot be missed. A Trump presidency means the possibility of a multi-billion dollar U.S.-Saudi alliance on nuclear energy. A, qu a, a quick aside here. Um, remember what um, the uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings there, I, I'll, I'll look for the actual report that was released by uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings' committee, uh, actually pretty soon before he uh, died, uh, about, about a lot of this area. And uh, Elijah Cummings uh, and his committee were investigating uh, this area, which I think is highly sensitive, actually. All right. Back to the text, bottom of page 194, Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, IP3, Iron Bridge, produces the PowerPoint presentation during the same month that an emissary from the Saudi and Emirati governments, George Nader, is meeting with Trump Jr. at Trump Tower to offer the kingdom's assistance in electing Trump's senior president. IP3 officials will tell media in November 2017 that they never hired Flynn as an advisor and never paid him any money. Their claims are contradicted, however, by Flynn himself, who reported on, quote, various financial disclosure forms, unquote, according to the Washington Post, that he had acted as a, quote, consultant, board member, and advisor, unquote, to IP3. Given the numerous high-profile omissions from Flynn's federal forms, the likelihood that he disclosed his role with IP3 merely out of, quote, an abundance of caution, unquote, as the company subsequently asserts, is remote. Yet there is more direct evidence that Flynn remains closely involved with IP3 after June 2016. During the presidential transition, Flynn will tell Thomas Barrick that he should meet with IP3. Given that Flynn had previously worked on a, quote, Middle East Marshall Plan, unquote, with ACU, it is telling that in November 2017, the Washington Post will report that while Barrick was working on Trump's transition team with Flynn, he became, quote, interested in developing a Middle East Marshall Plan to provide aid to poor regions of the Persian Gulf as a way to combat terrorism, unquote. See Chapter 5. The Post notes that, quote, both the ACU and IP3 proposals would require numerous governmental approvals to proceed, unquote underscoring the significance of key members of Trump's presidential transition team working on Middle East plans of this scope and complexity. On June 9, 2016, Donald Trump Jr., Paul Manafort, and Jared Kushner attend a meeting at Trump Tower at which they have been promised they will receive incriminating information about Hil Hillary Clinton from agents of the Russian government. Among the Russian attendees at the meeting is Ike Kavalazadze, a high-level employee of R.S. Agalarov's Crocus Group, which the Mueller report notes, quote, holds substantial Russian government contracts, unquote. Trump Jr. and Kavaladze are already intimately acquainted, as according to the Mueller report, Trump Jr. was the, quote, primary negotiator, unquote, for the Trump organization, and Kavaladze, the primary negotiator for the Crocus Group, 
when Donald Trump and Aras uh, Agalarov were planning to build a Trump Tower in Moscow in 2013 and 2014. The principals to that deal, Trump and Agalarov, had ultimately signed a letter of intent in January or February 2014, under the terms of which Trump would receive 3.5% of all sales related to the, to the multi-billion dollar project. The Trumps and Agalarovs were in contact about the project both before and after Trump's quote-unquote soft announcement of his national political ambitions in March 2014, with Ivanka traveling to Moscow to visit the site in February 2014, and discussions between the two parties on quote design standards, design standards and other architectural elements unquote lasting well into the summer of 2014. End of section. According to the New York Times, in June 2016, Thomas Barrick, an ambassador all Otaiba, that's from uh, Otaiba, is from uh, the United Arab Emirates, hatch a plot to, quote, arrange a secret meeting between Paul Manafort, unquote, who has just officially become Trump's campaign manager after doing the job unofficially for two months, and MBS. It is the perfect time for an introduction, the men reason as Trump has just recently clinched the Republican nomination for president. Barrick, having gotten his friend Manafort his job with Trump, is now positioning Manafort as Trump's intermediary to the Saudis. Indeed, the Times notes that in an email to Al-Otaiba, Al Barrick presents, quote, a Manafort meeting as a prelude to an MBS meeting with Mr. Trump, unquote. Barrick writes to Al Otaiba on June 21st, quote, I would like to align in Donald's mind the connection between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, which you have already started with Jared, unquote. Barrick feels urgency in connecting MBS and Trump because MBS has already secretly reached out to Trump for a meeting through Blackstone, ah, a private equity company with whom Barrick's own private equity firm competes raising the possibility that Blackstone, not Barrick, will get credit for establishing a pre-general election relationship between the Republicans' designated presidential candidate and the Saudi crown prince. Blackstone is a particularly troubling MBS Kushner interlocutor because the firm loans Kushner companies $400 million between 2013 and mid-2017 when it receives a $20 billion investment from MBS just days after Trump, now president, and Jared Kushner negotiate what they say is a $350 billion arms deal with the Saudis. The MBS-Blackstone deal implies that MBS is shoring up one of Kushner's most critical financial pipelines as a reward for steering the United States and the Saudi kingdom toward what Trump calls the biggest military equipment order in the two nations' diplomatic history. The MBS-Kushner-Blackstone connection is made even more problematic by the presence of Blackstone's co-founder and chief executive officer, Stephen Schwartzman, who is also the head of Trump's business advisory council, in Riyadh with Kushner and the president. Very interesting. Nothing deep state about this in any way, shape, or form. This is the drain. This is draining the swamp on a global level. This is what that's all about. This is the pinnacle of uh, drain the swamp, and is. Some folks who had been in the 9-11 truth movement up until the 11-9 operation said Trump was just probably keeping his enemies close, like he brought in Rudy Giuliani. He brought in uh, all of these 9-11 close people like Bernard Carrick. Uh, he brought in, you know, he did the uh, the uh, pardon, as we pointed out, for right. Arch Israeli military intelligence contractor, um, uh, Gabby, what's his name? Uh, Alexander, and I wasn't able to actually find anything about, I wasn't able to find much information on that, but I do remember hearing that at the time, Kobe Alexander. Kobe Alexander, yeah. But, uh, and once again, just to reiterate that um, not only is Trump bringing people into his administration, all the way from his own son-in-law to people like um, these close relationships with uh, Giuliani and Carrick, et cetera, not only that, like the, the New York on the ground um, suspects of September 11, all the way to the relationships with the business community that no other politician would even come close to having. So it's like, yeah, yeah, Trump's the 11-9 president and he's the 9-11 president because his connections go so far beyond 
what any other political candidate, I think, major political candidate for the most part, maybe with the exception of Michael Bloomberg, who whose presidential campaign fizzled, could dream of having. And I mean, it's just uh, the difference between Trump and Clinton or Trump and Biden or pretty much anybody else in this regard is beyond staggering. All right, back to the text. We are on top of page 197 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, as Bloomberg will later report, quote, the Saudi promise to invest in Blackstone's fund drove the firm's stock up more than 8%, unquote. In speaking to Al Taiba about his friend Manafort, Barrick says Trump's campaign is, quote, totally programmed, unquote, <laughs> on the present and future need for Trump to appreciate, quote, the closeness and alignment of the UAE, unquote. And he calls Manafort a, quote, friend of MBZ and the UAE, unquote. Though Barrick arranges a secret MBS Manafort meeting for June 24th at a location designed to, quote, avoid the news media, unquote, Manafort cancels at the last minute due to a scheduling conflict. Nevertheless, Manafort offers MBS two deliverables over the next three weeks. First, a private campaign, quote, clarification, unquote, that, quote, modulates, unquote, Trump's, quote, Muslim ban, unquote, proposal likely a promise that the kingdom will not be affected by the policy. And second, and more important, the removal of a platform plank at the Republican National Convention that would have, as Barrick put it to the Emiratis, quote, embarrassed, unquote, Saudi Arabia by unredacting certain pages of the federal government's 9-11 report that pertain to the Saudis. Unquote. Th that's, I believe, referring to the, quote, unquote, 28 pages, right? Yeah. Even the limited hangout, we'll find out who knocked the towers down, just turns out to be a total load of BS when you take things like this into consideration. It's it's ridiculous. It's true. Like they even limited the hangout of the limited hangout, uh, ultimately. And what I just want to point out something real briefly that, uh, you know, you know who else had this very strong relationship in the run up to the 11 9 operation with uh, Mohammed bin Salman is, of course, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Right. And uh, and so the Manafort's direct uh, conversations with uh, with MBS during a similar kind of time uh, set, I think, is is very interesting because that, of course, was another Trump controversy, quote unquote, that had to be managed. Right. Was the Epstein connection. And they did the Roy Cohn uh, version of it, of just sort of uh, attack uh, on all fronts. Remember, Sean, Sean Hannity seemed to even be taken aback at how frontal. Uh, Trump was in terms of mentioning the Epstein Island in relationship to the Clintons. Uh, and uh, because I imagine Hannity probably kn knew of the, uh, some of the actual close background of Trump and Epstein back uh, through the nineties. But the other thing I want to point out is that in relationship to our just previous episode in terms of uh, Netanyahu's book, that this has all been uh, basically priorly organize, right? This is, we're now reading through the actual political operation that then takes the 11-9 operation live in order to actually uh, create these uh, networks of agreement and then install Trump into the White House in 20, uh, you know, uh, in 2016 and 2017. But the, the actual planning for this goes before that, right? And the, the yacht summit and all of that and Netanyahu's leaked about the his multipolar operation in terms of the yacht summit and the and the solidification of the relationships with the uh, close arab leaders in the region uh is is also then paralleled by the the covert operation of the 119 operation to ultimately put trump in and these are the same players that actually uh, end up uh, doing it Good points. And it was Trump, Epstein, and Barack who were known to pal around together in the late 80s, correct? Yes, that's right. It was Trump, Epstein, and Thomas Barrack who were known uh, allegedly as the three musketeers uh, in the early 90s. And remember, this is this key time period, too, in terms of the very credible allegations made by Katie Johnson in the run-up to the 2016 election of having been allegedly raped at Epstein's place by Trump and Epstein. Uh, in the early 90s, right? And so this would be the time period of these three musketeers of Thomas Barrick, Epstein, and Trump uh, 
fits uh, the historical timeline here uh, in terms of also of what uh, Trump is being accused of at what time. All right, back to the text, page 197 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, Manafort's ability to compel significant Republican platform changes to please foreign nationals on short notice underscores his involvement, much touted by his former employee Kalimnik overseas, in the even more controversial RNC platform change regarding the provision of lethal weaponry to anti-Kremlin Ukrainian rebels. With Barrick having supplied the Emiratis with direct access to the Trump campaign through Kushner beginning in spring 2016, and with Manafort having delivered to the Saudis at least two pro-Saudi policy shifts in early summer, the question remained, what would the Trump campaign receive in return? Barrick communicates to Alo Taiba post-election his sense of anticipation for, quote, the things that we will have to do together, together being the operative word, unquote. And Alo Taiba replies, quote, let's do them together, unquote, to which Barrick immediately assents. But what value did the Saudis and Emiratis offer the Trump campaign before it achieved victory on Election Day, if not payment for side groups' intelligence gathering and disinformation services? A similar question must be asked with respect to what the Israelis expected would happen after Trump's election as president. Regarding the Israelis, one possible answer comes a few weeks after Trump calls Jerusalem quote, the eternal capital of the Jewish people, unquote, in a March 2016 speech to AIPAC, the same month his campaign began seeking aid from Israeli company Psy Group. That May, Trump discusses moving the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem with billionaire Sheldon Adelson, a Jewish megadonor with a long history of donating to the GOP and such, and such substantial connections to Benjamin Netanyahu that former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmer had once opined that Netanyahu, quote, works for, unquote, Adelson. By mid-August 2016, Trump, according to Adelson, has made an ironclad promise to the Republican donor that he will indeed move the embassy. In May 2018, Trump does as he has promised and makes the controversial move a decision quickly hailed by Netanyahu as, quote, a great day for the people of Israel, unquote. Lauding Trump for being, quote, unquote, bold, the Israeli prime minister also thanks Trump for his, quote, leadership and friendship, unquote. End of section. On July 15, 2016, the Turkish military attempts a coup of President Erdogan's government. The coup is unsuccessful, nevertheless, it has profound consequences for the region. According to Al Jazeera, quote, certain Arab governments and their operatives were openly supportive of the coup plotters and even offered logistical support to FETO, the armed organization led by the U.S.-based Turkish national Fatullah Gulen, that orchestrated the failed coup, unquote. While Gulen will immediately deny any involvement in the coup attempt, Al Jazeera's accusation that state actors have played a role in the event reverberates. Specifically, the Qatari media outlet identifies Egypt as, quote, the most vocal supporter, unquote, of the failed rebellion, in large part because Egyptian President El Sisi offered asylum to Gulen in the event he was a force to leave his permanent residence in the United States. Al Jazeera also identifies the UAE, like Egypt, a nation participating in the Red Sea conspiracy, as a supporter of the coup, partly because MBZ advisor Mohamed Dalan broadcasts an interview with Gulen on a television station he owns, and partly because, quote, emails leak from the personal account of Abu Dhabi's ambassador to Washington, Yusuf, Yusuf al Otaiba, reveal that he was in close contact with senior officials from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, FDD, a U.S.-based think tank primarily financed by the pro-Israel businessman Sheldon Adelson. An exchange between the UAE ambassador and John Hanna, a senior counselor at the foundation, provided valuable insights into Abu Dhabi's relationship with the coup plotters in Turkey, unquote. 
this is all very interesting. I just want to point out that that Muhammad Dalan, ha, ha, for a long time, had been sort of being looked like he was being positioned to become a new uh, leader of the uh, of the Palestinian Authority, uh, Palestinian opposition, and he also was apparently deeply uh, involved with the George Nader network, another convicted, uh, you know, pedof ped pedophile, pedophilia interested uh, character in all of this. Uh, and that uh, Dalan was a, a key contact for the Nader network into the Kremlin, and that Dalan uh, speaks Russian uh, fluently too. So Dalan is a, a key. He's, he's been known in Palestinian circles, identified for a very long time as a very likely in Israeli intelligence controlled asset. And now his connection then to this 11 9 operation and, and, and specifically Russia is just one more example of this very, very important Israel-Russia uh, pipeline. And uh, John Hanna was a former national security advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney. And John Hanna was named in the Mueller report when uh, Mueller was, when the report, uh, stories, reports came out of the Mueller report looking into the Middle East, in addition to Trump, Russia, and John Hanna's name was specifically mentioned as a person of interest in a Middle Eastern investigation. So, and then also Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Uh, some people call it the you know the uh, heir apparent to the project for the New American Century is a crucial one, I think, in all of this. And uh, Adelson, key figure, obviously. All right. We are on top of page 199 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. And I'll just point out about, obviously, with Adelson, the, the, his plane being used to, uh, to fly Jonathan Pollard and his wife back to Israel to be greeted directly by Netanyahu. And so there's a whole multipolar background, obviously, to the Pollard affair including that uh, Ann Henderson Pollard, his wife, had been, was uh, credibly accused of uh, uh, generating information that she was going to uh, give over to the uh, Chinese government. So there's this whole other aspect of the Pollard network. One is the question of, obviously, of Israel, highest levels of Israeli intelligence, um, but then some kind of backdoor to uh, Soviet uh, intelligence interests at the time. But then via Pollard's wife, it go, also goes directly into Chinese intelligence. And we're going to have to re, um, reconvene with the Seeds of Fire uh, text at some point and remind folks of this very, very intense uh, moment that is alleged to have happened in the May of 2000 in terms of the Chinese and Israeli intelligence operation using a Chinese reprogrammed version of the already Israeli reprogrammed backdoor uh, Trojan horse version of the Promise uh, software to, uh, to aid them in what has been deemed to be maybe the biggest uh, software heist in history at the heart of Los Alamos and, as we pointed out before, at the core of the uh, nuclear uh, emergency response team under the Department of Energy that's responsible for potentially securing and undoing uh, rogue uh, nukes. Um, Department of Energy was uh, Bill Richardson, the New Mexico governor. Epstein, um, Epstein uh, connected, um, <laughs> Greg Palast referred to as a, quote, Kissinger American at one point. So uh, throw that in there. And then also I wanted to circle back real quick to um, Pollard and something in the book BB that we didn't read from, a portion of the book talks about um, the President Clinton. He says President Clinton had uh, basically promised in a, uh, some type of deal to um, release Pollard. And then CIA head. Um, George Tenet threatened to quit over it, so Clinton did not do it. So once again, George Tenet, a very interesting figure in that um, era of, um, of geopolitics and U.S. foreign policy, for sure. And, uh, and just one more reminder, as you point out, uh, in terms of uh, Richardson being called a Kissinger American, that, that it, it looks like it was Kissinger himself who uh, assisted the Maxwell Network and uh, provided Senator John Tower 
to be uh, Robert Maxwell's uh, high-level asset in the United States. On on uh, a c- core of that was the Promise operation, and uh, and getting the uh, software into the nuclear laboratories. But then it's very interesting then to see the uh, re the next generation of that in 2000 in terms of Chinese and Israeli intelligence uh, breaching this key NEST X division. It's called the X division inside of Los Alamos, uh, where they have these drives that contain some of the most secret uh, nuclear information, specifically because it's about nuclear emergencies of crisis, of nuclear terrorism potentially, or of interstitial nuclear compromise in terms of devices, of the actual, you know, kinds of uh, uh, scenarios that were hyped up by the Fox News, uh, the Fox uh, Murdoch network in post 9-11 world of the ticking time bomb. Uh, and uh, 24 and all of that, uh, and uh, and that this was the actual, if there were a division inside of the entire U.S. government that dealt with the most intense and ticking time bomb, time, uh, bomb kind of uh, incidents, which, by the way, this is, a lot of this has origins in the Israeli security state of their justification of the ticking time bomb for the reason that they utilize such vicious techniques and torture uh, and, and all of this, uh, all of this stuff. But that 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 X division, the NEST, uh, they actually had the these very secret hard drives that had information on a whole array of potential scenarios of where nuclear devices uh, were threatened to be turned into a ground zero. By the way, and this is just the spring before two thousand and two thousand and one, uh, and and this has never really been explained. I've never even heard of this alleged Chinese and Israeli intelligence uh, operation at the heart of the U.S. nuclear complex uh, from any other source anywhere. And uh, and the timing is very interesting. The actual background of it being alleged having to do with a Chinese recreated version of the Israeli uh, version of Promise uh, being at the heart of it and an actual human intelligence special forces uh, aspect. And then as we pointed out, surrounding this is a f- the Cerro Gordo fire in surrounding the uh, the hills of uh, in New Mexico of Los Alamos, and as you point out again, Greg, the this Kissinger American Bill Richardson, the head of the Department of Energy uh, under under Clinton, uh, was also the governor of the state where there was this key other geography of the Epstein Maxwell uh, operation, the Zorro Ranch, which you might see as the western edge leading uh, geography of the the of the uh, Epstein Maxwell operation. So that that New Mexico geography is crucial and the fact of Bill Richardson Kissinger American being at the heart of that and then into Department of Energy which oversees the nuclear uh, um, the nuclear uh, the nuclear weapons aspect not the Department of uh, of Defense specifically but the actual nuclear weapons themselves are overseen by Department of Energy I think is crucial to all of this. Okay, we are on page 199 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, the New York Times has noted that Adelson, quote, enjoys a direct line to Trump, unquote. The Jerusalem Post reports that Adelson, quote, pledged to fund Trump's path to Election Day victory, unquote, in spring 2016 subsequently donated $25 million to Trump's campaign and went, quote, all in on the Republican nominee, unquote, a week before Election Day with a pledge of up to $25 million more. And The Guardian calls Adelson, quote, the casino mogul driving Trump's Middle East policy, unquote. The Daily Beast reports that John Hanna, who would end up on Trump's transition team just 120 days after the coup attempt in Turkey, subsequently found himself, quote, in Mueller's site, unquote, in Mueller's sites, unquote, as part of a, quote, lesser known side, unquote, of the ongoing federal investigation of the Trump campaign, quote, one that deals with Israeli, Emirati, and Saudi influence in the 2016 presidential elections. Hannah is one of the individuals who sits at the center of that nexus, unquote. Now, by the way, I just want to point out, too, that this is another 
crucial area that uh, that it harkens back to that little line in the Steele dossier about the Trump campaign itself seeking almost controversy around Trump Russia uh, in order to hide these other connections where it mentions China. But obviously this Middle East component is especially Israeli, also UAE and Saudi, also with some Egyptian uh, connection, uh, is w- w- that part was covered up so intensely for so long in, in the midst of the uh, you know Trump-Russia scandal that uh, I think that that was actually probably crucial to all of this, especially with, with how obvious on the surface uh, Trump's Israel connections were and Adelson and the Netanyahu connection and the Kushners and, and all of that. I think that the, the fact of the Red Sea conspiracy and of what was being indicated there and the connection um, amongst Israel and the UAE and Saudis especially, but then that connection back to Russia, that was being hid the most. I'll just, you know, harken back to Alan Dershowitz when I confronted him on C-SPAN, I think the second time, that what he was the most sensitive about was not being called a potential, you know, uh, a- agent of a, of a foreign government uh, or foreign governments. He did push back on that a little bit, but what he was prickling about as even not grounded in reality was my assertion of this relationship between Russia and Israel. All right. So that has for a long time been one of the most guarded geopolitical quote unquote secrets. I think it continues to this day uh, where there's such sensitivity around that. Um, well, Ryan Dawson, I'm sure, would take it as um, as a credible truth being expressed by Dershowitz because of how much they hate Putin. So I'm sure that would be good enough for people like Ryan Dawson. He would ring his bell and it would all be, yeah, swept away. Facts would be swept away. It's true. All right. We are uh, back on page 199 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, it is unknown whether Hannah is now a subject of one of the 14 ongoing federal criminal investigations using evidence compiled by the special counsel's office. While Sheldon Adelson's influence with Trump is well established by the time of the July 15, 2016 coup attempt in Turkey, Hannah's role in developing Trump's pro-Saudi, pro-Emirati, and pro-Israeli foreign policy will not be disclosed until after Election Day. In late 2018, the Daily Beast will report that during the 2016 campaign, Hannah had interactions with both George Nader and Joel Zamel, and that these interactions continued into the transition period when Nader, Zamel, and Hannah, quote, met with a top Saudi general to discuss plans to undermine and overthrow the government of Iran. Unquote. Per the digital media outlet, Hannah had known Zamel prior to 2016 and introduced Nader to him in 2016, either at the June 2016 St. Petersburg Economic Forum in Russia or before then, but certainly before Nader and Zamel attended an August 3, 2016 meeting together at Trump Tower. The outlet reports that in 2016, Hannah is, quote, close with Nader and Zamel, unquote, and even is listed on the website of Wikistrat, Zamel's pre sci group business intelligence firm, as a member of the company's advisory council. And a quick aside, I believe Dennis Ross was also involved with Wikistrat, too. All right. We're on the top of page 200 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, as the Daily Beast will note, quote, one of Zamel's companies, Wikistrat, was well-connected in Washington and had built up a base of high-level American military and intelligence officials to serve as consultants to the firm, unquote. The Nader-Hanna relationship predates 2016 as well, with Nader having worked with Hanna on a rock policy as far back as the second George W. Bush administration, when Nader was working for Eric Prince in the mid-aughts. Only the best people. Former acting CIA director John McLaughlin, considering how the Hannah Nader Zamel nexus could come under scrutiny by Robert Mueller, will say in 2018 that, quote, Mueller might be opening another front here. His mandate is to examine Russian collusion, but there's the clause in his mandate that's very open ended. 
to the, fa to the effect of, quote, and any associated matters, unquote. It could be a separate line of inquiry about efforts to influence the election by foreigners, unquote. Uh, and just a quick aside, remember that they, I imagine that this was a, a place of tension inside of aspects of actual U.S. counterintelligence and, uh, and justice in terms of Rod Rosenstein, the acting deputy attorney general, who had given the actual, uh, you know, the actual limits, the written, these actual written limits and mandate to uh, Mueller's uh, special counsel investigation. And just remembering Rod Rosenstein is the one who said, don't worry, we can land this plane. And then also being then post, uh, post government service, uh, then involved with uh, legally representing crucial uh, Israeli military intelligence group, the NSO group, Pegasus Software, and all that. So, so I imagine that 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 line was then used as a way to push back uh, in certain ways and to try to limit the scope here, both internally inside of the Mueller investigation and then externally by his uh, apparent supervisor. All right. Back to the text, middle of page 2000 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. And we're just going to finish this uh, paragraph off and then uh, finish this episode, and then we'll come back and finish the little bit left, including a annotations uh, aspect at the back, which I think would be really helpful uh, in, in laying out the entirety of the chapter's uh, analysis. All right. Quote, significant to Mueller's in inquiry, certainly, and to any federal prosecutor to whom the special counsel referred any line of inquiry involving Hannah and Nader would be the fact that, as noted by the Daily Beast, in 2016, Nader was, quote, developing his relationship with senior Saudi officials, which included Mohammed bin Salman, the de facto leader of the kingdom. Throughout 2016 and 2017, Nader met with the two Gulf leaders, and develop strategy on how to work with the Trump campaign, unquote. This observation must be coupled with one offered by Vox in April 2018, that George Nader's, quote, extensive personal ties to Russia, unquote, include the fact that he has, quote, traveled to Russia, done business with Russia, and developed relations, relationships with Russian President Vladimir Putin's inner circle at least as far back as 2012, unquote. It is therefore little surprise that, as the Daily Beast reports, quote, Mueller has questioned Zamel about his role pitching top campaign officials on an influence operation to help Trump win the election, which could have broken federal election laws, unquote. End of section. And we'll uh, end it there for today. All right. Um, thank you, and uh, we'll get back into this very soon. All right. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you, everybody out there. We appreciate you. Until next time, Antidote, we are out.